But, uh, let, folks, uh, good evening and welcome to the Culinary Historians of Chicago. I'm Scott Warner, president of this organization, which is still going strong after 27 years. Actually, one could say we're zooming along since we've been having re record attendance this past pandemic year with our free Zoom programs. We're kind of like PBS right now and that we sure welcome your financial support so that we can continue providing you with our eclectic buffet of culinary programs. If you'd care to become a member and automatically receive links to all our upcoming programs, just check out our website, culinaryhistorians.org. And what I've just given you is our appetizers. And now we're about to serve you our main course, Vivian Howard a la mode. I feel like I should thank the Make-A-Wish Foundation for getting Vivian to us tonight because I've wished having her as a speaker for years. But instead, I'll thank our incredibly involved culinary historians member, Chef Deb Silberstein, for getting us connected with Vivian. Uh, Deb, Deb is a professional chef, teacher, former Food Wet Network staffer, and celebrity chef networker who knows everyone. And she told me right before the meeting, she says, I love Vivian. So thank you, Deb, for helping make my wish come true. And now on with the show. First, here's a brief formal biography on our speaker, Vivian, on our speaker. Vivian Howard is an award-winning cookbook author, TV personality, chef and restaurateur. Her first cookbook, Deep Run Roots, Stories and Recipes from My Corner of the South is a New York Times bestseller and was named Cookbook of the Year by the International Association of Culinary Professionals. I was actually at the International Association of Culinary Professionals Conference the year that was held in Louisville several years ago when Vivian got of the award. She didn't just get that one award, she got just about every award they had that night in so many different categories. And I thought she was gonna get worn out. Uh, it was like she was on a Stairmaster running up and down the stairs to the stage every few minutes to collect an award. It was amazing. So she's a pretty healthy lady that she could handle all that running up and down. And Vivian created and stars in public television shows Somewhere South and A Chef's Life for which she has won Peabody, Emmy, and James Beard Awards. Vivian runs the restaurants Chef and the Farmer in Kingston, North Carolina, Benny's Big Time in Wilmington, North Carolina, Handy and Hot in Lenore in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she's a busy lady. In October, 2020, Vivian released her second cookbook, This Will Make It Taste Good and uh, A New Path to Simple Cooking. And I hope you're going to show talk about, well, you will be talking about that tonight, showing what your book looks like, Vivian. Uh, that's the formal capsule of her career. Now for a bit of informal insight into Vivian, here's what she has written about herself in her own words. I stole it from her website. She said, I'd have to say I'm a second time author whose young adult self dreamt of being a writer. I'm the mother of a twin boy and girl who once doubted her maternal instincts. I'm a chef who cooks for therapy. I'm a lucky daughter who counts her parents among her friends. I'm a strong-willed wife who loves her husband, but often struggles to work with him. I've seen that in, in their, in their <laughs> wonderful show. Uh, watch them bicker, it's wonderful. And I'm a television personality who can't bear to look at herself in pictures. My greatest strengths are fearlessness, creativity, enthusiasm, and humor. My most frustrating weaknesses are patience, organization, and numbers. But whatever Vivian says about herself, I'll tell you this, she's tart, savory, and delectable. And here tonight with all her true Southern grit, grit is our evening special, Vivian Howard. Let our feast begin. Vivian, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you, Deb, for, uh, for, for recommending me for this. Deb has been, uh, uh, Deb Silverstein has been a champion of mine for a long time, I'm, right after A Chef's Life first started. 
she asked me to participate in uh, the Chicago Home and Housewares show and, and do a demo on the main stage. And I was like so nervous and excited. And the demo was supposed to last like 12 minutes or something. And I was, I, we actually filmed me practicing for the demo. Uh, on a chef's life and I, I ran through what I was going to make in my whole demo in about three minutes. So uh, I had to I had to try to stre uh, stretch it out, but Deb was very supportive. And so I thank you for inviting me tonight. You know, I have a connection to Chicago uh, in that that husband that I you saw me bickering with uh, is 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 from Chicago. And so I always have had an affinity for the area and I find the Midwest to be really similar in a lot of ways to the Southeast, um, particularly small town Southeast, not so much Chicago necessarily, but I see uh, people from Nebraska and Wisconsin um, and, and more uh, rural Chicago. I find it the, the culture and the way people live to be really similar to where I am uh, right now, which is Eastern North Carolina. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's the middle of nowhere. It's like an hour and a half east of Raleigh and then an hour west of the coast. So uh, agriculture country. Um, I grew up here. I always wanted to leave here. One of my first memories was just wanting to live in a city anywhere, somewhere I could get like actual takeout or like, like take a cab somewhere. Um, and I, I, because I grew up on a tobacco farm, um, my parents grew and cured tobacco uh, for a living. And that's what everybody in this area did. We also very much, um, for the most part, grew most of the food that we ate. And that is, is really what I'm gonna talk about this evening is, is the food of the frugal farmer is what I call it. Um, and I really think it's, it's it's the food of rural people everywhere, all over the world. Um, historically, when people who lived in rural areas really uh, grew most of the food that they ate. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how, how that tradition really morphed into the way that I cook in my restaurants and the way that I cook at home and the inspiration for that second book that Scott mentioned, this will make it taste good. Um, so, yeah, you know, when you uh, when you grow up in a rural place, particularly a rural place that has a winter, and I know that all of y'all are, are familiar with that, uh, your, the things that you grow and the, the things that you eat are really, um, really revolve around the seasons. And so th the food of rural people um, in Eastern North Carolina, and I think rural people everywhere is really uh, based around this, this singular, this philosophy that most importantly to the philosophy is to have zero waste. You know, if you're growing all your food, uh, you really want to make sure that you eat all of it. So zero waste from nose to tail eating, uh, to fermented foods, to, you know, spoiled milk in the form of buttermilk. We're not going to waste anything uh, in a frugal farmer family. Uh, seasonality, of course, you know, uh, there are times of, of abundance and there are times when there's nothing coming out of the ground. So people who live and cook in a rural place are really paying attention to seasonality uh, not, not because it's fashionable or because the food tastes better in season, but because, you know, when you're growing the food that you eat, uh, seasonality is incredibly important. And the seasonality of preserving uh, foods during that period of abundance for that period of leanness is really, uh, is really essential to uh, the food of the frugal farmer. Um, also resourcefulness. Resourcefulness is incredibly important, I think, in any kitchen, but in the kitchen of the frugal farmer, it's incredibly important. You know, resourcefulness in the form of, you know, normally when our, our mustard green plants or our turnip plants die in the winter, uh, we would plow those under to prepare the soil for the spring, but, but 
here, uh, we, we let those, those turnip plants uh, overwinter because we know that in the spring, the early spring, they're going to shoot up a, a little a shoot that is edible and sweet and, di and different than the turnip green uh, from late in the fall. Uh, so resourcefulness, not wasting anything, um, the ability to stretch uh, small, small amounts of food to feed a larger group of people. Those are really the core philosophies of um, eating and cooking in a rural place. And, you know, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm 43 years old. I grew up here in Eastern North Carolina, Carolina. My family did not grow all of our food when I was growing up, but it was still very much the way that um, we organized the way that we eat. And like so many, uh, so many food traditions around the world, anything from prosciutto to kimchi, uh, to sun dried tomatoes, to miso, all of these things came out of a, a need to preserve uh, food uh, for the months that we weren't able to produce food. And they became, you know, cultural treasures. They became things that we continue to do, uh, not because we have to, but because they taste really, really good. And I make the argument that that's also true um, as it relates to the food of the frugal farmer. You know, when I think a lot of people think about Southern food, they think about um, a lot of a lot of ideas that I would consider misconceptions. You know, I think uh, many people believe that in the South, there's always a big piece of meat at the center of our plate and everything is fried and decadent. And there's, you know, a lot of macaroni and cheese and, and gravy and excess. And th there's nothing that could be further from the truth um, for two reasons. One is that the, the South is not monochromatic, which I think is something that we're, we're understanding more and more today. You know, the food of the port cities, the food of Charleston, of Savannah, of New Orleans, those, those cuisines are very different from one another. And they're incredibly different from the food of the rural South. I find the food of the rural South and the food of, you know, rural Wisconsin. I'm not sure there's not a rural Wisconsin, um, but I, I, the food of those places is more similar because um, ultimately, our communities are more insular. So we're not a port city where there are, are, are lots of influences coming, coming through our communities uh, on a regular basis. So the food of the rural South, I think, has some long-standing traditions that persist today because they taste good. Um, I would say that, you know, there are, if you're looking at the diet of a frugal farmer, it's really rooted in, in three things. And I would say uh, preserved foods, things like uh, cured, salted and smoked pork, pork ham hocks, uh, country ham, um, cured jowls, even bacon. Uh, these are, are preserved pork products. Uh, we would come together uh, as, as families and, and extended families and church communities uh, at the beginning of, of the, the winter when things had turned cold and we would slaughter a couple of pigs and, and, and the entire group would go to the work of preserving those pigs so that your family had meat to eat all throughout the winter and the early spring. You know, these cured pork products are one of the preserved items that I think will persist as time um, moves on and as, as the realities of living in a rural place don't mean that you, you grow your own food. Uh, also, the krauts that people make in the South, the sour corn, the fermented pickles, you know, just like places like Korea, you know, we love everyone in the United States has fallen in love with Korea's kimchi. Um, you know, our, our rural communities have these fermented pickles that we have relied on for a long time, often made out of cabbage. We made cabbage kraut or collard kraut. Uh, sour corn. These are all fermented pickles of the rural South. 
Um, also, uh, drying foods, another form of preservation, dried apples that become the filling for fried apple hand pies or greasy beans, beans that are strung and dried and then cooked and uh, rehydrated that way. Preservation is key, key, key to the rural Southern diet. Uh, I would say the next uh, I, quintessential component of the rural diet, and this stands against everything that we understand about Southern food is meat as a condiment. You know, when you're raising your own animals, when you're feeding those chickens and slaughtering those chickens and raising and fattening those pigs and slaughtering those pigs, and you see the value that life has and, and you participate in, in, in that animal's life and its death, you don't want to waste any of it. So meat on, in, a, in a rural family's life is, is really, really precious. And so rather than having that big piece of meat at the center of our plates, we use meat as a condiment. We boiled a ham hock until it was falling apart and then cooked collards in that broth and stretched those little tiny bits of ham hock across the pot of collards. Uh, to make the collards more like dinner and less like just a bowl of grains. Um, you know, bacon sliced really, really thin uh, as a way to make a very simple breakfast more exciting. Um, you know, meat was generally something that was stretched across a pot of something, or it was a special occasion food. You know, I mentioned the... Um, the hog killings that families would come together and and do every every winter, uh, you know, one of the very special things to come out of those hog killings in Eastern North Carolina, and one of the things that I think makes Eastern North Carolina cuisine really uh, distinct and unique uh, is the fact that sausage uh, is 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 our country ham. You know, I think of country ham as one of the products that the American South will forever be known for, but truthfully, it's more of an Appalachian um, thing of notoriety. We make country ham, but the thing that we do here that we really focus on that becomes our seasoning meat um, is air dried sausage. So sausage that is stuffed into casings that, that you glean from the cavity of the pig. Uh, and then those casings are hung in your salt house for several weeks to dry and cure. And then that becomes the seasoning meat that is stretched across a pot of turnip greens or turnip run-ups that we wait until the spring to make sure we get all we can out of that turnip plant. That is what I'm talking about, stretching stretching the meat across, across vegetables or grains. So we we either you know, use meat more as a condiment or as a way to celebrate. So my mom um, always told me that growing up, you know, they ate very little meat during the week, but every Sunday, every Saturday, her mother would go in the backyard and wring a chicken's neck and they would let the chicken uh, rest Saturday night so that the, the flesh was not so um, tough and they would have fried chicken and canned peaches every Sunday after church. And that was celebration, probably celebration that church was over. That's what I would have been celebrating. Uh, but my mom didn't frame it that way. Uh, so meat, you know, much to uh, the surprise of people that believe, you know, at the center of every Southern plate is a, a big piece of meat. Meat was really used more as a condiment and more as a celebration food. I would say the other, we've got preservation as uh, really, really essential in the rural diet. We have meat as a condiment. And then we really have in every, every rural community across the globe, there is a, an emphasis on a grain, usually one grain that that culture really leans into, and also a legume of some kind. You know, we think about red beans and rice, um, or for us in particular, where I live, it would be uh, dried corn and field peas. So the dried corn would be prepared any way from corn mush to grits 
to cornbread, to corn pone, to Johnny cakes, to hush puppies. You know, that cornmeal was the grain that sustained us. It was the thing that filled uh, rural people's bellies and gave them the, that carbohydrate energy to, to go through the day. And then field peas, things like black eyed peas, sea island red peas, lady peas, crowder peas. We have hundreds of varieties of peas in the South. That is our bean. I know that I, if you've ever watched any of my shows, you've seen me talk about um, butter beans too. Those are more of a traditional bean that we eat uh, immature and green, but really field peas and grits would be the, um, the, the grain and legume combo that people from my particular rural area have relied on to fill their be bellies and, and be that protein source that people who are working on farms or people who are moving through their very busy days are really relying on. So these are things that I learned um, not, not growing up here um, and appreciating the food, uh, but really these are things I learned after I returned and was able to look at my culture and cuisine as a thing and not just a thing to be ashamed of. Um, and so when we opened Chef and the Farmer, you know, I was not cooking food that looked anything like what I've described or really adhered to that philosophy in any way. I was cooking food that um, was really probably bad versions of the food I'd learned to cook in New York. And it wasn't until I started paying attention to the food culture around me and seeing that, wow, there's like really long standing traditions here. And this, all of this serves a purpose and it's, it's all about not wasting anything and making new flavors out of things, you know, that, that are around you by, you know, fermenting them or preserving them in, you know, in a sugar syrup. You know, one of my favorite things to do um, is to make fruit preserves, you know, um, and that is very much a thing that, you know, a, 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 a domestic uh, engineer from, you know, the early 1900s would have been making for her family with the abundance of fruit uh, during the summer. Uh, preserving it in hopes that you could have something sweet and and colorful on your table in the fall and winter. And that's really how I came to develop the way that I cook in my restaurants. And it became the, the genesis for my most recent book in that once I got on board and understood the, the beauty and the depth of rural Eastern North Carolina cuisine, I, I started uh, doing kind of on a much larger scale what my ancestors or grandparents would have done. You know, we started getting whole pigs. We started uh, salting and preserving their parts. Uh, we, we bought as much fruit during the summer that we, we could, you know, hundreds of pounds of blueberries, hundreds of pounds of strawberries, uh, watermelons so that we could preserve their rinds. And we made all kinds of fruit preserves and pickles. Um, we, we bought every vegetable that we could in excess. We dried, uh, tomatoes in the oven. We made pickled tomatoes. Uh, we did everything that we could so that we very much operated and functioned like a, you know, a, a household kitchen um, from an earlier day, uh, because our goal was really to use as many uh, fruits and vegetables and products from local farms as possible. And there was really not a lot going on in December, January, February, and March. Uh, that we would be able to access. So the idea was that we would preserve in the way that um, households once did so that uh, in those months when it's cold and nothing's coming out of the ground, we had things that were bright and, um, and shiny and tasty to apply to all the kind of humdrum brown food we were stewing up. Uh, and so every summer we would make... Um, this thing that I started calling uh, uh, spicy tomatoes in my newest book, uh, This Will Make It Taste Good, that 
I call these uh, red weapons because they really became my little secret chef weapon that I would put in in everything that tasted flat and everything that needed vibrancy and brightness. Um, and so they became, you know, the thing like, okay, we're going to do this with as many tomatoes as we can this summer so that we have tons of red weapons to use all throughout the winter. Um, I started making all kinds of like green relishes with the abundance of onions that we got during the summer with the overload of parsley and mint that we would get in, in early spring. And I would have this ready-made like salsa verde and chimichurri, had a baby and a bed of olives and it's made and it's there and it's ready for my chefs to just scoop a little out and, and toss with some blanched asparagus. And suddenly you have an amazing, an amazing dish uh, that, that took a few minutes because you had the foresight to preserve um, or or put together these these flavor heroes in advance, and I imagine that that's the way that my grandmother and my great grandmother approached their kitchen um, when they were cooking for their families. They made fruit preserves all summer. They made chow chow at the end of summer, early early fall, with all the things, all the tomatoes that were not going to ripen because the days were shorter and all the peppers that were still hanging on the vines and the new heads of cabbage that had popped up. They would make chow chow so that they could apply that to their bowls of beans and cornbread during the winter to make them more exciting. And I really saw myself as a modern day parallel to uh, my grandmother's experience, if you will. And so that became the foundation for the way that I cooked in my restaurant. And I had a, you know, a whole uh, section of the walk-in dedicated to these flavor heroes, things we had preserved, um, things that were there for the taking to, to toss into a quick saute to give something, you know, our signature kind of flavor and make it exciting. And so when I stopped cooking at the restaurant so much because I had twins and because I had a TV show and because I was writing uh, this giant, of Eastern North Carolina uh, food history and storytelling, I guess. Uh, when I stopped cooking at the restaurant so much and I found myself cooking at home more, I was like, oh my gosh, I really wish I had some red weapons. I really wish I had some can do kraut uh, so that I could just make dinner really fast and make it exciting. So I started going to the restaurant and stealing some of those things and taking them home and having them in my fridge so that I could use them in my home kitchen and, and make dinner really exciting. Uh, and so when I had the opportunity to write my second cookbook, I, well, kind of a long story, I'll backtrack just a little bit. After this book came out, I woke up every morning for a year. And the first thing I did, you know, we all pick up our phones or some of us do, I do, I'm trying not to. I'm not trying that hard, but ideally I would not. Um, but I woke up nearly every morning and read the new reviews on Amazon uh, for Deep Run Roots. And one of the things that I read over and over again was that like, we love the stories in this book. We wish the recipes were more simple. And so when I had the opportunity to write a second book, I was like, come hell or high water, this is gonna be simple. Like I'm going to make these recipes really simple. They're all gonna live on one page. They're gonna have, you know, like four instructions. You know, this was my dream. And so I started writing this simple cookbook and I was bored to tears. It was like, okay, like I, I can clearly do this, but there's not, there's none of me in it. Like it does not feel, it does not feel, interesting or special or it doesn't speak to my style and it doesn't even taste like my food because I'm clearly not all that simple. Um, so in that simple book, I had written a, you know, a table of contents and the last chapter in that book was called, this will make it taste good. And in that chapter, I had recipes for all of these flavor heroes that were built on the, the, the study of preservation and, and food of the frugal farmer 
in Eastern North Carolina. I had all of these recipes for those things. And I said, hey, if you really wanna make the above recipes in the rest of this book, very exciting, make this stuff. And then I thought, you know, what the hell am I doing? Why don't I just uh, write a whole book about these things? So I flipped the whole idea for the simple book on its head and made um, a whole book called This Will Make It Taste Good. And every chapter is about uh, one of these flavor heroes. And you, you get the recipe for the flavor hero. You get, uh, I write a story about the personality of the flavor hero, the inspiration for it, the way it functions in dishes. And then I give you a bunch of recipes using it. And so for me, it's like next level uh, kind of meal prep, if you will. I think if you, if you talk to any professional chef who runs a restaurant kitchen, they have this same kind of subset of, of little um, back pocket uh, signature things that they always go to to make their food taste like their food. And mine was inspired by my experience uh, living and cooking and working here in rural Eastern North Carolina. And I, I really want people to understand that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of tension between rural and urban nowadays. Um, I, I grew up in a rural place. I always wanted to leave. I lived in New York for many years. I moved back here and I, I understand the tensions on both sides. You know, in many ways, I was, um, I was an urban person before I left rural Eastern North Carolina. Like I, I very much felt shame for being from a rural place, for, for having people, parents who were tobacco farmers. And then I moved to an urban environment and I, I understood like what I already respected about you know, the urban experience. And then I came back to Eastern North Carolina and I saw um, my rural experience through a different lens. And I, I saw that, you know, my, my rural friends and family had uh, a different skill set, a different wisdom, um, a different way of moving through the world that was equally as valuable and just as smart and just as uh, tenacious and it's through the food of, of this rural place is really the way that I was able to tap into that and understand it. Um, and, and, and so I have always had a, a real, um, a, a, I, I feel the tension of, of this rural urban divide in a way that I think a lot of people may not. Um, and so I encourage, I encourage everyone to, to, to think about uh, the skills it takes to live in a place with less resources and the skills it takes to thrive in that place. And, and the fact that the people who grow our food um, are often people who live in, in rural environments and they're, the, their greatest concern um, is for the earth and the environment that they grow, the, the thing that makes their living for them. And so I, I, if you have not checked out Deep Run Roots, my first cookbook, it tells a, a really in-depth story of uh, rural life. And um, I think will shine, open a window and shine a light onto perhaps a way of life we don't necessarily think about, but that it would help for us to be able to understand a bit more. Um, I've probably rambled on enough about that. I didn't expect to talk about that, Scott, but <laughs> um, I've seen some- uh, You've got some questions. If you'd like, yes. I can ask them for you. That would be great. Great. Um, what can you serve chow chow with? Oh, great question. So chow chow, is a relish essentially. And as I mentioned before, it's made at the end of the growing season when you're getting ready to like, just, you know, turn your garden over and, and put it away for the winter. And it's made from the things like green tomatoes that are not gonna ripen. Um, that's also 
uh, funny enough, where we get the idea of fried green tomatoes. Like you wouldn't eat fried green tomatoes in June, historically. You would only eat them in like September and early October when they are, um, when they're just not gonna ripen into red tomatoes. But so chow chow is made from peppers that are still hanging in the garden, cabbage, green tomatoes, vinegar, sometimes some spices. And it is an excellent, excellent addition to like a bowl of beans or it's wonderful on like a roasted piece of meat. It's great as a, um, a condiment with roast chicken. It's excellent on a, a grilled cheese as a foil for the cheese. It's great on a ham or turkey sandwich. So it's, it's just a crunchy, bright, uh, uh, really um, sometimes acid forward uh, condiment. Okay, love the food heroes. Do you have any go-tos for dealing with leftovers? Yeah, I mean, I think leftovers, you know, one of the things that I've gleaned from cooking from a rural perspective is my ability to be resourceful with leftovers. And that's one of the things I like about the flavor heroes is that, you know, in, in my house, um, every Sunday I boil a chicken and I boil it till it's falling apart so that I have both chicken meat and I have a really flavorful, almost chicken fatty broth. Uh, and so all week long, I kind of work to use the broth and the chicken in different ways. I also, on Mondays, my mother generally roasts a side of salmon. So I have a fair amount of leftover salmon. So all of the flavor heroes are very much uh, either acid forward or um, like salt and uh, herbal forward. And so they become a great way to bring disparate leftovers together to make something that feels cohesive, uh, you know, so that, that if you have leftover chicken and you have a little bit of broth, you can just very simply put the chicken and the broth and some little green dress, which is that green condiment I was talking about before. You can put that together and you have a little soup or a little sauce, chickeny soup that you can put over rice. Um, if you cook that salmon and you had it left over, you could toss it uh, with the candu kraut or the red weapons and that the acid from that is gonna wake up the flavor and the fat from the salmon. And you can eat that with, you know, some blanched asparagus or shaved radishes. Uh, I think that anytime we're thinking about leftovers, we really want to transform them. And I think it's important when you're trying to transform a leftover to bring it together with some really assertive flavors so that your leftover tastes like something else. Uh, and that's that's where the the flavor heroes kind of come in there. How important is organic, sustainable agriculture to the quality of food? Um, well, you know my my uh, role has always been, you know, I, I I would love to be able to say you've got to buy organic, you've got to buy, you know, You've got to know exactly where this broccoli came from. But ultimately, I don't think that we're in that place in our culture. I think we just need to um, come to terms with cooking with fresh ingredients again. You know, if you're not able to shop at a farmer's market or you're not able to have a CSA, like let's shop the perimeter of the grocery store. Let's stay out of the middle lanes. Like let's, 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 cook from, you know, whole cabbage. Let's like get sweet potatoes still in their skins. Um, and I think once we start doing more of that, once we as a uh, culture start cooking from fresh whole ingredients, then more of us will become more in tune with sustainable agriculture, which I think is, is far more important than organic from my perspective. Um, so let's just all start like cooking vegetables and fruits and eating less meat and better meat, which I think is a more, um, you know, if you're looking at the, the impact of, you know, of raising food on, on our planet, I think meat is really a, a more important place to look um, and the, the types of meat and the amount of meat that we eat. 
So Linda said, I was surprised by what you said about the rural diet. Is it really more vegetarian than meat-based? Are people on this diet healthier? Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I did not say that it was vegetarian. I said it was grain and vegetable forward. I think people, rural people have long loved meat. You know, it's a celebration thing. It just was very hard to come by. So by virtue of that, you know, they would put a little bit of meat in, in several things. So that meat gets stretched across it rather than being at the center of it. Um, and certainly as a result of eating less meat on a daily basis, I think people were, were healthier, but I think their lifestyle was also a lot different. Um, they, you know, when you're having to work to grow all your own food, you're working, you're moving. Um, and that's a very active lifestyle. So yeah, I would say that we didn't have these, um, systemic issues of diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure in the South, um, you know, historically. And that, that, that definitely was reflected in our diet. So Holly asked, some of the recipes in your new book have some fun names. Are rated onions? Uh, are these names you came up just for the book or is that what you call these items in your everyday life? Well, so some of them um, are, are things that I've always called them, but for the most part, um, I gave all of these flavor heroes personalities and, and, and also gave them names and not just the flavor hero recipes in the book. Um, it's not just those that are novel, like there are all kinds of recipes. Like one of my favorites uh, is uh, dinner for pregnant people where the entire recipe is uh, written from the first person perspective of me ordering my spouse around cooking me dinner for the first time ever because I'm pregnant and I'm irritable. Uh, there's also um, K&W made, made me do it. And K&W is a, a longstanding cafeteria here in North Carolina. And they had this jalapeno cornbread on their cafeteria menu forever. So uh, there's a, a cornbread in the book that is inspired by that. Um, there's also inspiration strikes party rolls. So like everything is, um, is, is really kind of quirky and fun. And it's an, it's an imaginative, I think really out of the box kind of cookbook, you know, I mean, every flavor hero, this, this will explain this to you. So every flavor hero um, with names like Sweet Potential, Red Weapons, R-Rated Onions, um, uh, Quirky Furky, um, Can Do Kraut, every flavor hero, I have, at the beginning of that chapter, I am dressed, I have personified the flavor hero in my dress. And I'm, there's a portrait of me like acting it out. So this is very much, a, a, this was a creative endeavor that I think really pushes the limits of what cookbooks do in that there's, <laughs> in that there's a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of personal storytelling. There's a lot of, uh, you know, create creative imagining of what things could be because, um, you know, when you make something that really is like uh, a chimichurri and a salsa verde had a a baby in a bed of olives, you have to give it another name. Like, what do you call that? So I call it little green dress because it's the, the green sauce that goes great with everything. Like that little black, black dress that I could fit in before COVID. Um, so, yeah. So to, to what extent is rural cooking in North Carolina influenced by African-American cuisine? Tremendous extent. Tremendous extent. I mean, I think that for me, it's really hard to separate uh, African American cuisine from any part of the Southern uh, cooking experience. Um, you know, I, I I think that it's really interesting because so many of these ingredients that are are you know, essential to, to the rural experience here, like 
field peas like okra, you know, there are things that we, we claim as Southern, but we have not um, necessarily claimed as, as African. And I, I think that um, me in particular, my experience learning, just learning about the cuisine of Eastern North Carolina, I've learned so much of it from um, an African-American woman uh, by the name of Lily Hardy. Uh, who, who works on a farm that I buy produce from, and and she's become my my cooking home cooking mentor. And uh, so I think it's very hard to to talk about this this food and this culture and this cuisine without giving like tremendous credit to the African American community. So well, how are Miss Lily and Warren doing? And in fact, it goes a little bit further, but start with that because I think that's, you know, catch up time, right? Yeah, so they're good. They're, um, so when the pandemic started happening uh, and we closed our restaurants, I was really concerned about, um, you know, what Warren's farm would look like because so much of the, the produce that they grew went to restaurants. Uh, but, you know, so many more people uh, have become interested in where their food comes from. They've become, um, maybe because we were also hyper-focused on cooking and being at home. Um, his CSAs are out of the, you know, just through the roof. So they couldn't be more thrilled about that. Um, and, you know, this is, oddly enough, uh, Warren was telling me that He's like, oh, you know, Miss Lily, she's left me for a period of time. She's gotten another, another job, and I'm like, what? And he's like, there's someone growing saffron right up the road from us, and she is, she's picking saffron in eastern North Carolina. Um, so I thought that was to think about growing saffron in this place, <laughs> and then Miss Lily <laughs> harvesting it is just like, you know. Mind-boggling. Yeah, it shows us. Uh, it shows us the thing that the last show that I made is all about. It's about like how the food traditions we bring to wherever we land shape that place, and how that place, you know, shapes those food traditions. You know, and because uh, someone decided to grow saffron here in eastern North Carolina, that saffron is probably going to get integrated in some way into the the cuisine and, and culture of this region and you know flash forward a hundred years and, and it's part of the vernacular here and I just think that is uh, such a beautiful thing. So the same person said as a dairy farmer's daughter what do you consider some possible midwestern equivalents for those condiments and flavor heroes? And it's almost like it's her question to answer. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't think that um, I don't think that the heroes are necessarily region specific. You know, I'm talking about things like plum tomatoes and and parsley and mint. And I think these th this book is not necessarily a southern book. The the premise behind like the preservation and and making these things that we use to bring simple ingredients together to make a meal. Um, that, is, that is what I see as particularly rural. Uh, but the ingredients themselves are, are not region specific. I mean, there is an entire chapter, a flavor hero called Quirky Furky, which is a take on uh, Japanese furikake. And oh. you know, for me as a, a white woman in the South, to put a um, a chapter in a book about furikake was like a, a kind of a, a a choice I had to make, you know. Like I'm, and can I do this? Like how can I do this? It's legitimately something that I've made for years um, in in my restaurant and in in my home because I, you know, growing up in a rural place, my children don't have a lot of uh, ethnic diversity in their lives. And one of the ways we introduce that into our home is through uh, food and books from other cultures. And, 
And so I have always cooked with ingredients like that. And I don't think that it's wrong uh, for me to, to, to share that with my children as a means to make them understand that they're not the center of the universe. So um, this book is really less about the rural experience and more about my experience as a, a woman uh, cooking for her family uh, in, in the 2020s. Sure. So are we going to get a second season of your show somewhere south? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, Somewhere South is a, a series that I am so incredibly proud of. Um, I'm proud that we were, we were learning about these stories and pursuing this narrative uh, far before, you know, it became the thing that everybody, you know, felt like they, they should do. Um, but I, you know, like you said, the PBS model is really a challenge in terms of, um, you know, fundraising for a show like that, you know, Summer South took us to all, all parts of the South, you know, we filmed in Texas, we filmed in Florida, we filmed in, um, in, in Kentucky, we filmed all over the South and that's expensive. And we, we, we would have never been able to make Summer South without the, the grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and, you know, it's just, I, I have been on PBS for seven years now and the model for fundraising is just really, really hard. And perhaps we can do something similar on another platform because I think it's brilliant. If, if y'all don't know what Somewhere South is, it was uh, a limited series that l launched this week last year it was, it was so crazy that it came out at the very beginning of the pandemic and i'm like oh my god this is so great it's going to start during the pandemic and then when the pandemic when the show's ending the pandemic will be ending and i couldn't have been uh -huh. more wrong <laughs> um but every episode of the show um is about a dish that every culture shares so um there's a porridge episode, there's a hand pie episode, there's a barbecue episode. And, and basically I learned from cultures and communities in and around the American South uh, about their version of that particular dish and then thereby learn about their experience as my neighbor in the South. And, and the idea is really to, for me to, to share with us how we are all more alike than we are different by, you know, by connecting through the foods that we share. Um, and also it's a story of like, we all come from somewhere. Um, and, and what are the things that we bring? The, how did the food traditions that we bring with us shape the place where we land? And then how does that place shape our food traditions? And so I, I hope if y'all haven't watched it, that you will, will check it out. And I do hope that maybe we'll be able to do another season. Well, you know, the internet is the great leveler. You could put something on the internet and let it fly. Yeah. Without yeah all that does, overhead. Exactly. It doesn't have to be exact. You know, what's important for me is the story and the message and, and reaching people. And you have the following. Anyway, do you serve fried chicken at your restaurants? And if so, what makes it special? So I have never served fried chicken in my restaurants until we reopened Chef and the Farmer uh, a couple, three months ago um, after the pandemic. And I put fried chicken on the menu for the first time. And I put it on there because I finally have something to say on the subject. And it's, uh, I, I, what makes it special is the, the red weapons, the pickled tomatoes that I was talking about before. Um, they're pickled in a, uh, vinegar and oil and jalapeno, rice vinegar, um, brown sugar, lots of spices. They're pickled in a br that brine. And so I marinate uh, the chicken in that brine and then bread it kind of traditionally, fry it. And then I mix the hot, the spicy pickled tomatoes with honey and drizzle the fried chicken with that. So now it's on the menu. 
I remember trying to eat as a vegetarian in rural Illinois and Indiana many years ago and found that I couldn't even eat the vegetable sides since they all had seasoning in them. What is it like for vegetarians in rural South currently? Um, I think that you would probably still struggle <laughs> at um, a lot of, you know, the, the country style buffets. Uh, but then, but there aren't so many more of them. Um, but the fact is in these rural places, the seasoning um, historically was always like seasoning meat or cured pork. Um, and that was the way, but you know, what, what we don't think about is like on that buffet, you have the cured, you have the butter beans cooked with the cured pork and you have the collard greens cooked with the ham hock. But then you also have fried chicken, chicken and you might have barbecue and you might have ribs. Like that's not the way it would have normally been done. You know, you would have had the, the collards cooked with the ham hock and they would have been served with a bowl of rice or a bowl of grits or maybe some sliced and marinated cucumbers. So it, the, the meal wouldn't have um, been all about the meat, but I would just always ask if you're in the South and there's a vegetable dish that looks like it speaks to you. I would, I would ask, I would also like anytime you see something that has tomatoes in it, like in the summer tomatoes, uh, butter beans and corn is a really common staple that is normally cooked with no pork. Um, anything that uh, has uh, long cooked items like collards will tra traditionally have pork. So I would just ask. Okay, Jennifer said, I made citrus shrine that must be one of your names, on February 9th and just used my first piece of lemon rind today in tuna salad for lunch. When do you put yours in the fridge? And does your citrus shrine develop liquidy like stuff in a jar? Mine smells citrusy amazing. Oh, good, good, yes. So, you know, once the skin, so you did it February 9th, it, I recommend like a month, So, but I really recommend going a little bit more because I don't know, you know, how tough the citrus was in the beginning that you had. So you plenty of time. I would just go ahead and put it in your fridge now. Um, and yes, it, it can develop like a, a kind of a, a lacy kind of exterior of the fruit itself. So just rinse that off before you use it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, as you're storing your citrus shrine in your fridge and you start using it and you have more space in the jar you can put more citrus in there and just make use of that brine um, so you kind of have some going all the time so what did it feel like to become a celebrity chef <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh i don't know you know i i don't really feel i don't feel particularly celebrity or chefy I, um, I think when you live in a rural place, you know, like, no, where I live, nobody cares what anything about Vivian Howard. <laughs> so particularly with the pandemic, you know, I don't go places. So um, I, I don't know. I can't. I, it's your I life. Can't. Yeah. It's just, it just feels, you know, it just feels like Vivian with a, I don't know. I don't know. All right, please re <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll make it easier for you. Please regale us with a few more ideas about what you eat on big celebrations in Eastern Carolina, Christmas, New Year's, birthdays. Absolutely, so Christmas. Uh, we generally have uh, a like a rib roast for Christmas, but that's not traditionally Eastern North Carolina. New Year's Tom Thumb, which is a, a celebration sausage uh, that would have been made at that hog killing that I was talking about earlier. Um, so a lot of the meat from the pig would have been ground up into sausage, and a lot of that would have been stuffed into traditional casings that would have come from the small intestine, but the most special sausage 
uh, was the Tom Thumb and it was stuffed into the pig's appendix. And so that appendix would be about, it would weigh about three pounds once it's stuffed. And then it would get hung in your salt house or your smoke house uh, from roughly like after Thanksgiving until New Year's. And it would cure and shrink and develop flavor over that period of time. And then on New Year's Day, uh, you would boil the Tom Thumb and then use the leftover broth to cook cabbage or collards. And then you would slice the Tom Thumb and display it out around your greens. And you might serve that. That would be a great use for that chow chow, like to serve all those rich flavors with the very bright, um, crunchy chow chow. So that's New Year's. And that's so interesting, like, because when I think about that celebration sausage, I think about Codacchino from Italy, which is also a celebration sausage, which is stuffed into a pig's appendix. It also has the pig skin ground into it. So it's a little different, but I have to think that those things are connected and that's a rural Italian community. And we're talking about a rural North Carolinian community. And so those are the things that I'm like, ah, that's so exciting. Um, so uh, New Year's, we mentioned Christmas. Uh, Easter here would always and forever be deviled eggs and like, uh, like very immature greens, like the turnip greens or the run up turnips that I mentioned, uh, birthdays and weddings, rehearsal dinners, a pig picking. Um, I guess it's become clear that pork is really big here. Um, but so a pig picking, which is a whole pig cooked over wood. Um, and people, it's called a pig picking because you come around and you pick off the pig <coughs> the parts that you like. And that the accoutrement for that would be some kind of corn product, you know, a cornbread, hush puppy, whatever your family's corn product is. Uh, and barbecue, I mean, slaw and whatever style slaw you're about. Ours is normally creamy and a little sweet. And then potato salad. Okay, so Deb actually threw you a few compliments. She said that you're one of the most down-to-earth people who appears to be on TV is the same person in real life. I am. <laughs> and, and this is something I've picked up over the years of listening, talking to different guests for here, but most people don't know that having a show on PBS isn't paid for by PBS, but you have to fundraise to cover all the costs of the series. And boy, you better have a book or something to sell to at least help you recoup some of that, right? Yeah, it's, um, people don't want to think about that. And they also think like, you know, support your, when you have hear these ads about support your local PBS station so that you, we can bring you the programming you like or you want, like you're not supporting individual shows when you're doing that. So there's this, this disconnect you're literally supporting that station. So just think about that. Um, and it's, this is, I, d I just think that if people better understood the PBS model, they would better know how to, you know, support I'll the show. Yeah. Uh, when you refer to butter beans, are you referring to lima beans? I have always thought of them as two different beans, but many people call lima beans butter beans and I actually had an argument on Facebook about this about two weeks ago so love your answer this is from Alicia but I recognize the question so butter beans from my my vantage point are immature green lima beans so if we were to leave the butter bean on the plant it would continue to grow and it would become a, a white fat you know, plump lima bean, but we in, in Eastern North Carolina and other parts of the South have an affinity for something we call butter beans and a proper butter bean. And you very see, rarely see them these days is a butter bean that is about the size of your pinky nail. And my pinky nail is smaller than most because I have a bad habit of chewing on my nails when I'm alone. Um, so, uh, but a butter bean is just an immature lima bean and they're known for their like creamy buttery like uh, texture and, and they're like paper thin skin and they're kind of green 
their green immature taste. What was your argument, Catherine? Uh, that they, she said they, she said they, she says butter beans are not lima beans. And I said, well, they are, except yours were more immature than what I was describing. But you know, you get what you get in the freezer section here. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. You verily, I mean, in my life, I've so rarely had a, lima, a butter bean that small. Like, um, but when you speak to, you know, old country cooks, that's, that's, that would be prized. And you know why that would be prized to get a butter bean that small is because people, you know, sit and open these, these pods and shell these individually. And so wouldn't you want to just shell bigger beans so you get more yield? Uh, so a, like a proper bowl of tiny butter beans must be such a labor of love. Oh, yeah. Okay. Are your yeah. twins? Kathy, Kathy, excuse me. I've just gotten a note that Vivian has to get up early tomorrow morning to milk the cows. So, uh, so well, we have gonna... we have two questions. Okay. One, which I think is a nice one, but I, one I want to ask you my question. Oh, no, um, that's important. Uh, no, I, I can I can send a note. Are your twins interested in cooking with you or their dad or with their grandmother, or do they just not at all? <laughs> and you know, it's a big problem. It's not a big problem for me. What I've learned is that. You know, your kids, they're way smarter than you think from the time that they're tiny and they realize what your like pain points are, your pressure points. And so food has always been one for me. Like, you know, I want them to eat a certain way. I want them to eat certain things. And, and so uh, they can see that I have passion behind that. And so that has become, and very early on, it became a, a, one of the ways that we quarreled you know, um, and, and so cooking is very much the same way uh, in that th I think they see that as my work and, and I work a lot. And so they don't want to engage in it. Um, that being said, like if I'm making like something sweet, they're in the kitchen all the time trying to participate mainly to like get a finger in some frosting probably, but I think they'll come around. Oh, I think they will, especially when they have to f eat their own production. Exactly. Because <laughs> so they have very high standards. <laughs> absolutely. So you talked earlier about how your parents had tobacco, that that was what, that was their bread and butter crop. Has that changed in that region over the years or is that yes. the most? So tobacco, tobacco production has largely left North Carolina. I mean, there's still a few people growing tobacco, but it's just, it's not um, something you see a whole lot. Um, most of the farms here in Eastern North Carolina uh, are uh, poultry or pork farms. Um, and most of the row crops support uh, those farms and then they grow corn or soybeans or wheat or sorghum to feed those animals. Well, Scott said we should finish up. Scott, you've got to unmute yourself. This yeah, was delightful, yeah. by the way. What, what I told Kathy earlier, she told it to me to unmute myself. I said, yeah, go mute yourself. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, but this, your, your, your program was, was uh, delicious and your food for thought was savory. Loved every second of it. And to everyone, well, everyone I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, we, we have made, we're making a podcast of this and it's going to also, uh, we checked with Ryan and we're going to have this on our YouTube, on our Facebook channel, the whole show. And Kathy, one of our speakers, you know, Adrian Miller, I bet Vivian. Yes, yes. Adrian Miller is on Somewhere South, the barbecue episode. Yes. And he's going to be our speaker in May on barbecue. I saw yeah. that. That's amazing. It's a, well, we, I could pinch myself for getting people like you and him. It's, 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 it is amazing. And uh, when he spoke on this, what was it? The uh, African-American uh, chefs who cooked at the White House since George Washington. Yes. How many, how many viewers did we get on that, Kathy? You're muted. Uh, over 2,000. Yeah. Listen to wow. that podcast. Yeah, so, it's by you're, far you're, our most popular one. 
So you're you're going to be. We expect a lot of hits for you as as time goes on from this, and and we, so we're going to spread the meal all over the place. So thank you so much. This was wonderful, and thank you, Deb, for making my wish come true. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for having thank me. You. Thank you. It was thank you, very Disney. good. You're thank you. Loved it. Thank you. Y'all have a great night. Oh, you, you too. too. Sleep well and get to those cows. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>